Please, and we'll stand and sing together 128. Everyone stand and join the choir as we sing together. Each step I take. Each step I take, my Savior goes before me, and with his loving hand, he leads away. With each breath, I whisper, I adore Thee. Oh, what joy to walk with Him each day. Each step I take, I know that He will guide me to higher ground. He ever leads me. Each step I take just brings me closer home. At times I feel my faith begin to waver. When up ahead I see a chasm wide, it's then I turn. Closer home. I trust in God, no matter come what may, for life eternal is in His hand. He holds a key that opens up the way that will lead me to the Higher ground, he ever leads me 
Terry Copeland, chairman of our deacons, headed this way to lead our prayer this evening. We're delighted you're here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Father, we do thank you again for this day and for your many blessings. Thank you for the services this morning. And Father, we're anticipating something great this evening. Father, I pray that you bless during the song service and through our preaching. I pray that you especially bless our pastor this evening. Give him the words, wisdom this evening. And Father, we thank you for those that are on a missions trip. We ask a special blessing upon them. Help them not only now, but throughout this week to see many souls saved. Please go through with us throughout the remainder of the service. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Terry. You may be seated. The choir is going to sing for us at this time. This is just what heaven means to me. again please let's turn to number 41 and sing an old timer in the sweet by and by everybody stand and join with us number 41 sing this almost without a hook there's a land that is fairer than day
Ladies are playing, the choir's coming down. Shake hands with those around you if you would please. Take a few moments and let's fellowship together this evening. Thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for this opportunity to come back to your house tonight, God. Thank you for the good message we heard this morning from Pastor Laws, Lord. Thank you that you have sealed us, Lord, and salvation, and we can't get out of it, Lord. I pray for this offering tonight. Jesus, please bless the gift and the giver, Lord. Please help preacher as he speaks tonight. Give him the words he'd had to say, Lord. Thank you for loving us. I want you to know we sure do love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless us as we give this evening.
children have some money they want to place in the mission offer, they can do so at this time. Certainly, if they have a scripture verse, they're welcome to stay up and say it. Thank you, ladies, very much. All right, here we go. I'll oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his good. His mercy endureth forever. Psalms 119, 29. Very good. Look at the pal. God changes. Times. Eight. And teachings. Very good. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that for whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Very good. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Very good. What times I am afraid, I will trust in Thee. Headlines, front time, TV and the radio. Everyone has to question where they all go. We'll be seeing the angels all around the mess. Headlines, don't for praising Jesus. Jesus comes, Christians go. Train up a child in the way he should go. Proverbs 22 6. God is love. Amen. Amen. All right, turn around. Jesus wept. That's good. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Very good. Are you singing? God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He answers prayers. He answers prayers. He's so good to me. Very good, girls. John 10. John 10, 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Right. Jesus sent him, I'm in the way to choose the Christ. No man can live father but by me. John 14, 14. Right. Believe. 
Um, Lord Jesus Christ, and I shall be saved. All right. God is love. Very good. Give them a they may go downstairs to their class at this time. They're, they're moving. Just before the message tonight, by Pastor Walls, the Lawsons are coming to sing for us. He loved me still.
I'm glad for that, aren't you? He still loves me. Juanita Bowman, if you'll come up here, you get our Good Deed of the Week award, Juanita. She takes the pictures for us when folks are baptized. And I appreciate her doing that, don't you? Hope she just stays busy the whole time, don't you? All righty. Yes. You can tell me anything you want to, Genevieve. Yes. Marion Turnbill. Okay. I'll take care of those. I'll take care of those girls. Yes. They made some dresses. Take on the trip to Mexico. That's what they did. We we'll finding Judges chapter seven. I'm gonna talk for a few minutes. Teresa Woods, Wilma Griffith. They're here, aren't they? Where are they? Where's Wilma? Yeah. I was kidding them this morning. I was, uh, when they sing, I was told them I was going to put on TV single. <laughs> now, I kid a lot, okay. Uh, I, I was, I was going to tell this story on them, but I didn't do it. I was going to tell that their life verse of Scripture used to be is it, uh, I would not have you ignorant brethren. <laughs> but now they've changed it to if any man will come after me, let him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you owe me, don't you? <laughs> Big time, they owe me. Big time. My daughter is with us again. She didn't get a chance to come because she attends another church. Her husband's went on a mission trip. She's also expecting a baby that she, we thought she was going to have several times this last week. She's asked me to sing for her both all the time she's been here, and I haven't. And I reluctantly are going to try to do so tonight because if she has that baby, you're going to say that that singing made her have that baby. <laughs> I know what you're going to say to me. So uh, I'm going to try to sing a song that I uh, hope will be a blessing. <clears throat> Once a man whom we know as the Son of God Hung upon a cruel old tree He suffered pain as no mortal man He took my place, he did it all for me he, he did it all for me each drop of blood he shed for even me when my Savior cried bowed his head and died Oh, praise the Lord, He did it all for me. When I step just inside of those gates of pearl and the Savior's face I see, I'll gladly kiss those nail-scarred feet Oh, praise the Lord He did it all for me He, he did it all for me Each drop of blood He shed for even me When the same Oh, praise the Lord, He did it all for me. Judges chapter 7, no, that's fine. 
That's Judges chapter 7. Thank you, but that's not necessary. Thank you, Jerry. You love it. There's a deaf man that loves that singing. Amen. <laughs> Don't tell me he ain't got good taste. <laughs> Can you hear Jerry? See? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I had the privilege of visiting in his home last week and his wife and uh, enjoyed that visit we had with him. Your favorite? I'm your favorite preacher and singer? <laughs> Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7 with me. You can remain seated after I read a few verses. I'll have you to stand with me, please. Judges chapter 7. We're continuing our study in the book of Gideon, or excuse me, about the life of Gideon in the book of Judges. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, that's his name that he was given, remember, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod. So the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mor in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people which are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And they returned to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them by... I will try them for thee there. And, uh, and it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. For he brought down the people of the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lappeth putteth his their hand to their mouth were three hundred men, but all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lappeth will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and all the other people go every man unto his place. Let's stand together, please. We'll pray, then you can be seated. Father, I want to say I love you tonight. I want to thank you for being such a wonderful Savior. Lord, I want to thank you for all these years, 32 years I've pastored, and you've always helped me. I haven't been all I need to be, haven't been all I need to do. Sometimes I get feeble and weary in the way. But I'm glad you've never forsaken me, and I'm glad you've always been there. And I just want to thank you for that tonight. If you would never help me again, I've enjoyed what you've done for me. I pray this hour I could honor you. Let people know how wonderful you are. Who you sure are a great God and Savior. Speak to every heart now. Use us to honor you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated, please. <clears throat> so you'll know exactly where we are in this stage of our study on Gideon. If you'll just follow with me for a few minutes, even if you've not been here for one of these uh, five or six messages we've preached, I believe you can follow along well enough to know where we are. First of all, the time of Gideon is the time of Judges. And the Judges, we know this, this was the key scripture verse of the time of the Judges, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There were no absolutes, as I mentioned this morning, just everything was confusion. Every man had their opinion about something. And in the time of Gideon, we saw this, that there was the ruin that the nation faced. <clears throat> the Midianites, the people of the east, and some Amalekites had come in and surrounded them. They would impoverished them. They would imprisoned them. And they were in a great ruin. Let me tell you something, folks. You're never going to get help till you see how bad you are. You don't go to the doctor till you get sick. You never ask God to help you till you know you have a need. And so here they are. They're a ruined nation. Well, what God did for a ruined nation is he revealed himself to that nation. God revealed himself to them. God says, I'm your answer to your ruined condition. By the way, God has given us a revelation of himself. It's in this book that you and I have right here in front of us. Amen? Before us this hour. And then what Gideon did, he started a reformation. He started his own house. He tore down his own father's altars, built a new altar to God. And he did that in the nighttime. We know the story. We've looked at it. So what God did after Gideon, after the run, the revelation, the reformation, God, he get, had a ratification uh, from God of what he was supposed to do. In other words, God said, here's, I assure you what I want you to do. And God gave Gideon three things that he would get, did for him. He let, God, let him know God was with him. Number one, the Spirit of God came upon him, right? Uh, let me see, Isaiah 10, 27. Isaiah 10, 27. 
I've got that down for some reason. I didn't look, need, to look, need to look at that right before church. I put that down for a reason. Let me see what it is. Isaiah 10, 27. I think I read that this week. Isaiah 10, 27. Let me read it to you. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulders and his yoke from off of thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So we talk about the anointing of God, the Spirit of God destroying the yoke of bondage. Now, I mentioned this last week. I don't have time to deal with this tonight. If, 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 if you didn't get the tape, you want to get, you should about the Spirit of God. How the Spirit of God anoints us for service. How the Spirit of God wants to use us. How the Spirit of God can help us become great witnesses. Gideon was weak, hiding under an oak tree, but filled with the Spirit of God. He's ready to fight any battle, right? The disciples, weak, defenseless, but when the Spirit of God filled them at Pentecost, they faced, gave their lives, died for their cause, because the Spirit of God makes a difference in your life, right? So God ratified what he wanted to do with the Spirit of God being upon him. Second thing he did, he let him have soldiers to fight for him. He sent out a cry, and 32,000 men came to fight for him. And then the other thing that he did, and you remember these stories as children, remember these stories, he play, prayed and he asked for the fleece, of the, uh, fleece to be dry and the ground wet. And he got up in the morning, and what happened? Fleece was dry and the ground was what? And he prayed again. He said, I want the fleece to be wet and the ground dry. He gets up in the morning and brings a bottle of, or excuse me, a bowl of water out of that fleece because God was telling him, now Gideon, I've answered your prayer. I've showed you that God wants to do something for you. Now he's getting ready to face the enemy. That's in all those chapter six I just talked to you about. Five and, or chapter six. Now he's getting ready to face the enemy. This is the night before the battle. This is the day before the battle. And God comes to Gideon and he says, Gideon, here's this hour for the battle. He said, Gideon, you've got too many people to fight with. Seven long years they've been in bondage, the Midianites. Seven long years they had fought and struggled and been impoverished and imprisoned in their own land. And now right before the battle breaks out, God says, Gideon, you've got too many. And Gideon's going to learn a valuable lesson in life. And this lesson is this. Many are called, but few are chosen. <laughs> if you want to find out who's for you, get in a fight. <laughs> you know, one thing about being a preacher, you can pretty well tell who your friends are. Did you know that for the most part? And pretty well when you stand where we stand, you pretty well know whether you're liked or not. So Gideon had an opportunity. He's going to find out that when he gets in a battle, he's going to learn a valuable lesson that a lot of people want to come for the trumpet sounding, but ain't a lot of people want to go to fight. He's going to find that. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to find out there's a lot of people, yeah, want to be around when good things are happening, but when the bad times come, they want to leave and run. And Gideon is going to find out something, a valuable lesson. All in verse number one, the Midianites are in the valley below. They're in the valley. In verse number eight, you can just look at it and see the children of Israel up on a hilltop and they're overlooking them and they're seeing them as where they are. Now we know this from reading all the story. We know this, that Gideon has 32,000 men. Say it with me, he has how many? 32,000. In, in, in Judges chapter eight, verse number 10, you see how many of the Midianites where they were. How many were they? Somebody tell me. Judges eight, 10, how many, how many, how many is there? 135,000, you see that? So it's 32,000 going to fight 135,000, right? Uh, what is that, four to, four to one odds, something like four, almost four to one odds? Uh, four to one already, and, and they are, uh, and, and they're in the, in the uh, minority. I'd be like, it'd be like Tommy Justice and Brother Harvey. Oh, come here, Tommy, you come here. And Brother Harvey's here, and Pete, you stand here, and Bob Stout, you stand here. It'd be four against one. Now, in this case, no problem, no difficulty, all right? But <laughs> thank you, man. Just want to do that to you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Go sit down. <laughs> I hate a smart aleck preacher, don't you? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But they were four to one. But now, <laughs> excuse me, fellas, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Forgive me. Pray for me, all right? All those things you need to do. <laughs> but now it's going to be 400 to one because he's got 32,000, or 41, 32,000 against 130. 5,000. Now, but you know what Gideon does when God says he's got too many? Gideon doesn't bark, fuss, or hesitate because God had given him a spirit that he would not be contestant against the will of God and whatever God had wanted. God had brought him to the place of where he was. Now, I want you to notice some things about this tonight. First of all, there's the purpose of the reduction. Why did God want Gideon to get rid of some of the army that he had? Look in verse number two and you'll see why. 
He said, And the Lord said to Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into thine hands, lest Israel vault themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. If you don't put down the reason why God wanted him to get rid of some of his army, the reason was because of pride of their hearts. That if they went out and won this battle and they defeat the Midianites, they'd say, oh boy, look at us. Look how great we are. Look how wonderful we are. And we'd, we'd vote ourselves and we'd say, oh my, my, aren't we a great people? Look at all we've done. We've, we've defeated those Midianites. We've destroyed them and we have done this in our own power, in our own might. See, what happens? Mankind does not see the danger of pride in his life. The first sin ever committed, young people, the first sin ever committed, adults, was pride. Isaiah chapter 14, the devil up in heaven, I will be like the most high God. I will ascend to the sides of the north. I, 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 seven, eight, nine, ten times. I, 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 I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then God tells him, I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to destroy you. But pride was the first sin. You see, in our times, though, we live in different times. In our times, we're told, if you want a job, you've got to learn to brag on yourself. You've got to boast of how good you are and what you do and where you've been and where you're going and what you're going to do. But see, it's not so in the service of the Lord. We are to say if the Lord will, we will do this or that. And since pride is the enemy of God and God hates pride, Proverbs chapter 6, he hates a proud look. Uh, six, Proverbs 6, 6, 17. And since God hates it, then any army fella, any army of the children of God should not want pride to live in his life. For instance, let me show you what pride does. Pride gives you a perverted view of God's deliverance. For instance, if they won the battle with this number of people, they'd say, we saved ourselves. Now, it's impossible for you to save yourself, spiritually speaking, is it not? But oh, if you thought you could have part of it, wouldn't you feel awful proud of yourself? And that's what people do sometimes. People feel like, I'm serious, I'm, I'm, I meet people continually. They think they've got part of this thing where they can save their self. And if God just helped them a little bit, they can save themselves. And that's just not the truth, folks. You can't save yourself. You can't lift yourself by your own bootstrings. You cannot save yourself. We're totally dependent upon the grace of God and salvation. And I said that I think well enough this morning. But pride delights to exalt itself. Let me show you a little story in the Bible. It's one you remember. And just so you remember it, I'll give you a caption. The caption of this story is seven ducks in a muddy pond. Okay, say it with me. Seven ducks in a muddy pond. You remember the story. It's in the Bible. Do you know that? This, little, this man named Naaman captures some Israelites. He's a leader of a great nation. The Bible says now Naaman was a great man but he was a leper. And he had captured a little bitty uh, Israelite slave girl and she was working in her home and probably killed, his, killed her mother and father probably and took her captive. And while she's working in the home, she knows that Naaman has leprosy. And she goes to Naaman one day or has someone go to him and says, says, Naaman, if you'd go over and see my preacher, Elijah said, he'd tell you how to get rid of that. Did you know there's no record? Listen to me now. I want you to tell you. There's no record of any leper being healed in the Old Testament except Naaman, a Gentile. Not a Jew, a Gentile. Did you hear that? Jesus made reference to his healing in the scriptures because when he preached the gospel, he mentioned, he mentioned two people in the Old Testament who were both Gentiles who relied upon the grace of God because the Jewish people would not rely on the grace of God. He was telling them how the Gentiles trusted God by grace and were saved and the Jews would not do it. So God gives the illustration of Naaman. And Naaman sends somebody over to see Elijah. Well, Elijah doesn't come out. He's not impressed. And so he said, he said you, go tell, you go tell Naaman, if he'll go dip in Jordan's river seven times, seven ducks in a muddy pond, oh, muddy Jordan, said so he'll come forth and he'll be clean. You know what Naaman did? He got mad. What? He said, I tell you, that's the, he said, there, aren't there better rivers over in Babylon? He mentions two rivers over there that are real nice. Aren't those rivers better than that? Aren't those rivers? He, I thought he'd come out and he'd tell me this. I thought he'd wave something over me and he thought through his pride that what was happening. But I want to tell you, he did not get cleansed till he went down to Jordan and he took seven ducks in a muddy pond and God healed him of his disease, right? But pride would have kept him from doing so. Let me say to you, the Bible teaches us this. Listen to me now. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the, it's the gift of God, not of works. Come on, lest any man should 
boast. I want to tell you, there'll be nobody walking on the streets of heaven bragging about how they got there. Hmm? Not a one of us is going to strut down the streets of glory and say, oh, I'll tell you, I made it. Not a one of us have one thing to brag except on the goodness and the grace and mercy of God. The reduction that God wanted was because of the pride of Israel. Along with what John the Baptist said, I must decrease, but he must increase. Okay, that's about pride. The purpose of the reduction of pride not only gives you a perverted view of salvation or deliverance, pride also gives you a perverted view of our service. <laughs> you know, don't ever think this, that honestly God doesn't need you. I'm sorry. He loves you, he cares about you, but God doesn't have to have me. He doesn't have to. Now I'm glad he'll use me, aren't you? I'm glad if I'm available to him that he'll, he'll, he'll do something with my life. But I want to tell you something. Did you know, and this isn't being harsh, this isn't being unkind. It, it's just the fact of life that people pass off of the scene, but God's work goes on. Come on, right? And I hope that when the time comes for me to leave this world that this church won't miss a, a stroke, that you'll just keep on going and keep on doing and keep on living and keep on going right. Because it's not with God to save by many or by few. You see, God didn't have to, to use Saul or God didn't have to use uh, uh, his son Jonathan in the conflict with the Philistines, but God chose to do so. Because and the truth of the matter is, is we can't get anywhere in any conflict without God helping us. Look with me, please, in Psalm 127 for a second. Would you please? Psalm 127. For me, you passed the scripture, but turn there. Psalm 127. Look at verse number one. <clears throat> Psalm 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that do what? Notice the next three words. Except the who? Lord, keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Except the Lord, except the Lord. Can you see us as proud, wretched, weak? To boast for a holy, almighty God, we're something when we're not. And let me just give us a warning. I've seen organizations grow through the years I've seen them because when they get bigger, they get full of pride. And listen to me now, pride is the greatest cause of apostasy. Because what happens when you get so high, you think you can't stay anymore where you are to stay on the truth and doing right, and you start to compromise. Pride. Now, that is the purpose for the reduction. Here's the programs God's going to use to take the army from 32,000 down to 300. Here's the program God's going to use. Number one, he's going to, ask them, he's going to give them two tests. There's a test of dread and the test of drinking. Now, the test of dread was is this, is that Gideon was to go to the army. And listen to what he said. He says this, if anybody here is afraid, you can go home. 22,000 Baptists <laughs> left that day. 22,000 people. Can you imagine that? What if I give an invitation? Uh, folks, if y'all don't, don't want to serve God no more and you just want to go home, right now and just walk and leave out. And let's say that that proportion of people walked out. Now, I want to tell you something. I don't care what you say, and you can say what you want to say. That would be discouraging. Now, would it? I don't care what you say. I never forget one Sunday I'd preach, and we was in a little building. I'd preach. We had 108 the first Sunday I was there, and we, only, we had, I think, uh, 16 pews and all they're only about eight foot long. We said running three or four hundred people on Sunday. I mean, honestly, you when I stood to preach, I couldn't move hardly to my right or left because people were sitting everywhere. And I preached one Sunday and I had 50 people get mad and walk out because of what I preached about. And they, they said, I, they just, I preached against mini skirts, just stuff like that. anything that a preacher I preach against, and rock music. Feel those things I preached against for 30 some years. Not going to change. I won't die that way. Old and grouchy and fussy and right. Amen. And instead of you boys don't come along behind me and do the same thing, when I get to heaven, I'm going to look back and I'm going to haunt you. <laughs> About once a month, you don't preach against that, Brad. You and, you and Jason and Travis. I'm going to hope God gives you the hiccups you can't preach. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> the test of dread. Look with me, Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20. Look at verse number one with me, please. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse one. Look what it says. When thou goest, Deuteronomy 21. Look with me now, I'm sorry. My brain's going faster than I, than I want to tonight. 
when thou goest out to battle, and by the way, I'm just thank God it works most of the time. <laughs> Deuteronomy 20 verse 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, so what does he say? Be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which, which, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Hmm? Look at verse 8 of that same chapter. And the officers shall speak furthermore unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him do what? Go return to his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. <laughs> you know that being a coward and fearful is contagious? Let's say that we got in a war. And you say, well, I'm not sure if I want to fight or not. Well, I want to tell you, if it's just me and you there, I'm not going to be real sure I want to fight myself. Do you know that Ecclesiastes says that a two-fold cord is not easily broken, much less a three-fold cord. And people bind together their strength in numbers. Is there not? I've always felt this way, that my wife and I, with God, can handle about anything. If she's with me, if she's behind me, and she gives me encouragement, I can say honestly, I can say, bring it on. Because I've got a bond there. I've got someone, I've got my best friend, my wife, who's there with me to help me. We're going to fight together. We're going to go through it together. We're going to live through it together. God's going to help us. I'm just saying, so, 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 so being, being fearful and frightful, it gets contagious. Remember, listen, just think to the Bible real quickly. Remember when David went out to fight Goliath? You know where all the men were? They were hiding in the caves. You know, we read the first part of Gideon's story in chapter 6. You know where all the people are? They're hiding in the cave because they're fearful and afraid. And Gideon's hiding underneath the tree because fear is contagious. That's why some churches catch it and quit. They won't take on any more missionaries. They won't try new programs. They want to adventure out into a bus ministry. They want to reach out to their community. They don't want to challenge the world. They don't want to do what Jesus said for us to, that he'll build this church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And, and listen to me. And, and we, get, we get fearful of what God wants us to do. When we do, it's contagious and we'll die. Young people get contagiously fear caught. When people say, you can't stand for that. As a young person, you can't live that way. Come on, don't you hear those things? You can't live your life that way. You can't witness like that. You can't go there. You can't do that. Listen to me. You can't tell your friends what you believe about that. Listen, that's a bunch of garbage. Yes, you can if you want to. Amen. Old people catch it sometimes. They get fearful. What's going to happen to my future? Am I going to be able to pay? Come on. My bills. Am I going to be able to live through this? Am I going to be able to face this sickness? Am I going to be able to face this trial? Couples catch it. Can we make it through this burden? Can we go through this? You catch it because it's a spirit of fear that comes your way. And listen to me, folks. You can't have That's why Jesus said, listen, listen. Why, 366 times in the Bible, one for every day of the year plus leap year, God said, fear not. He didn't want you to be fearful and faint-hearted. That was a test of dread. Never fear. I'm with you. Oh, listen, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that all the times of life, have you ever been afraid preacher? Yes, I have. Physically, emotionally. I'll never forget. I, I don't want to tell this story. I'll never forget. I got so scared one night. Physically, I got so scared one night uh, that I couldn't speak. And when a preacher can't speak, he's afraid. Man alive, I never will forget that. I'm telling you, I was so afraid. I, honestly, you think I'm kidding? I couldn't say a word. I just laid there in utter silence. And I slept that night with a fillet knife in my hand. <laughs> Fear is contagious. I went for one night in Smithville, Arkansas. I was preaching a revival meeting. I never told this publicly. And I'm not sure what happened that night. At about two o'clock in the morning, Something walked into my room. Now you think I'm crazy, but I'm not. And I was so afraid, I would not lift my head. I stayed the whole night as still as could be. Sometime in the morning, a verse of scripture came to me. Ecclesiastes that says this, I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy. That night I preached that verse of scripture. I gave an invitation we had, we had 15 church members get saved that night. 
that whole week, I get goosebumps thinking about it. That whole week, I wouldn't go behind the door without looking behind it. I wouldn't sit at a desk without looking underneath it. I wouldn't sit with my back to the window the whole week. Because in that sense, I was, had a holy fear that I was doing something that God was so near, I didn't want to do one thing that disrupt him. I've never told that story publicly. People think you're crazy, you're weird. But I want to tell you something. Fear is contagious. It'll make you not want to fight. There's another test, only the test of dread, the test of drinking. He said, I want you to take him down to the river bank and I'm going to give him a test. Here's what he said. If you can see me, watch this. He said, those that drink like this, that you put them in a group, then those that drink like this, he said, you put them in another group. And those that lap like a dog, they would take it and kept it in their hand. There was 300 of them. Now, the reduction in the force was this. There was a number to eliminate the pride. The first test of dread was to eliminate the faint-hearted. Listen to me now. And this test of those that would lap with their tongue was a test to take care of getting rid of the careless. Because, see, they were just a few feet away from where the enemy was. And if you don't keep your eye on the enemy and you're doing like this right here, you can't see the enemy. But if you're going like this, So God is saying this to you. God is saying in your Christian life, you learn to take all care when you live for God. Let me tell you something. If you're going to live for God, you better watch the devil. Hmm? You better keep an eye on Satan. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Better watch it. Hey, now listen to me. Don't you, get ha don't you get mad at me. But you don't watch what television programs you watch. You put a guard on it. You better watch what music. Some of you men better watch out the women you talk with. Some of you men better watch out on the job you work in, who you flirt with. Shouldn't flirt with nobody, by the way. You better watch it. Oh, it's just, it's just, it's just meaningless, preacher. It's a bunch of garbage. It's not meaningless. You got to keep an eye continually upon the devil. Can't be careless. Small things are important. 9,700 of them, no longer in the ranks. They wouldn't keep the. Listen to me. Listen to me. Why don't you listen to this statement I read? You can't let your physical desires cause you to lay down your spiritual guard. You can't do it. You can let your physical desires lay down your spiritual guard. You can't do it. Hmm. <laughs> Take care of the small things. Call somebody if you're going to be late. It's a small thing. Pay your bills. Be kind to people. You don't know when you're going to meet them again. Don't you be kind to people? <laughs> uh. Lastly, the promise that gave him after he was reduced in size. God told him in verse number 12 of chapter 7, and the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of Israel lay in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. Here they are, a host of army. Here they are. But Gideon displayed, displayed his obedience to God. The promise that God gave him is he was going to win the battle. Now next week I'm going to preach on when a biscuit won a war. Because Gideon's going to find out how God's going to do it next week. He doesn't know how God's going to do it this week. But it's good. But here I want to tell you this lesson. I'm through. <clears throat> God only becomes great when you become little. I'll handle it. I'll take care of it. No, God won't become great to you. But little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a, a, a crown you can win if you go in Jesus' name. 
Man alive, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sorry. I just, uh, 2 Corinthians. I am sorry. My wife said I was the other day. She said, you're sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Can I show you this verse of scripture? Look at verse number 5 with me. <clears throat> I'm sorry, let me start, I'll start reading verse 5. 2 Corinthians 12, 5. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. It's Paul talking. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think me above that which he seeth in me to be, or that he heareth of me. Lest I should be exalted above measures through the abundance of the revelations. He'd been talking about how God had taken him up to heaven. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to do what to him? To buffet, lest I should be exalted above measure. God, I wanted to keep him in reduction, should I say this? For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, and it, that it might depart from me. He said, what did he say? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I'm just saying to you that when you learn to become little in your own eyes, you become big in the eyes of God. They lost, listen to me now, they lost all but 300 men out of 32,000. Is that correct? Answer me. Did they still win the battle? Now listen, don't take me wrong when I say this to you. But wouldn't it be awful to be a person that could not be in the ranks of the, of the fight and still not be missed? You are to be so involved in the work of this church that if something were to happen to you, your efforts would be missed. You see that? And not the 31,700. They didn't even need them. But you are, listen to me, and you are. You are valuable. I, can, I look out and I know where everybody, I know where most people sit in this auditorium. That's why I can keep up there 719 families, 19 families, not individuals, 19 families on our prayer, on our prayer list. I pray for each one of them every week. We can't try, can't try to contact them periodically as the best we can. It becomes increasingly harder. I'm, I'm just talking to you now. Okay, I'm talking to you. I so miss the days where I can just go in someone's home and sit down and talk with you. I miss that. But I can't do that hard anymore. I'll go in for a few minutes and I'll stop and say, I've come here to pray for you. And I'll pray. And I'll leave my, my average visits, I guess, are anywhere from five to seven to eight minutes, if that long. Hospital minute, stay two or three minutes. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm tired and I'm, I'm just, just overworked. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I can't, can't have that. But I'm just wanting to know that every one of you are valuable to what we're trying to do here. You understand that? And I want to remind you that every one of us are soldiers. And seeing you in your position helps us do the work we're going to do. We're admonished endure as a good soldier. We're admonished the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're admonished put on the whole armor of God. Are we not? So, okay, let's get rid of the pride. Let's take the test of dread. If you're fearful, what time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Let's uh, check our drinking. <laughs> Do we keep a careful eye on things? Do we keep a careful eye on prayer, Bible reading, uh, church life, witness life, giving life? Let me tell you one story. And I want you to turn two passages of Scripture and I'm through. Turn to Psalm 18. It's so hard to get through all of this, folks, and just skip through it like I don't want, it doesn't mean anything. But Psalm 18, I just want to show you something. I'm going to tell you a story. <clears throat> Do you remember the story? Just bear with me now. Help me if you can. Do you remember the story when David committed uh, adultery with Bathsheba? Remember the story? Do you remember what time of the day that took place? It's about, it's the middle of the day. Listen to what happened. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, that the day came forth when kings were to go forth to battle. And where was David? He was home. You know what he was doing? He was sleeping in his bed till noon. And David, who was a warrior and a fighter, who had something had got wrong with him, got up at noon, went out and saw Bathsheba. Had her come to his house, committed adultery with her. Listen to me now. Fourfold it cost him. His family was visited. His children died. What a horrible price. Listen to me. I want you to hear me because I'm going to tell you something. When David got older in life, you know what? The, instead of David wanting to stay home, you know what he did? He would go to the battle. You read about it. And, they, and it, one time he almost got killed by a giant and someone of his own men helped spare David's life. 
And they had to beg David to stay at home and not go to fight. Because David, in his older age, realized that if you don't keep fighting, you lose. And I want to tell you something. <clears throat> I'm just like you do. I get tired of the fight sometimes. I get weary in the way sometimes. I'm just human just like you are. There's sometimes I get tired of just saying, won't you do right? Sometimes I get tired of just fighting. There's sometimes I just get tired. And some, listen, sometimes I just get aggravated. Come on, I'm just being honest. Come on, you've been there. Don't act like servant. Don't act religious. You've been there. But I want to tell you something. If you don't stay in the fight, you've already lost the battle. Here's the prayer. I want you to pray with me. Psalm 18, verse 34. Are you there? Psalm 18, 34. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. You need to ask God to teach you how to fight again. Look at Psalm 140, verse 1. It's the last verse. Psalm 140, verse 1. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man. Which imagine mischief in their hearts. Continually they are gathered together for, what are they gathered together for? For war. They're continually at war with me. I want to stay continually in the fight for God. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. I want to encourage you tonight. Listen to me. If you're weary in the battle, I want to encourage you not just to stay with it. Would you do that, please? I ask God continue to give me some more fight. I've, listen, I've seen, a lot of, I've seen a lot of preachers. I know a lot of older preachers now that I'm older. And I see so many of them just going by the wayside. I see so many of them not staying in the fight. And could I get you tonight to pray for me that God would help me just to stay in the fight. I want you to, I want you to, I'm asking you as, as your pastor, I'm asking you to pray for me tonight. I'm not asking you to pray for yourself. I'm asking you to pray for me tonight that God would keep me in the fight and make my hands strong. Would you pray for me tonight? That's my prayer request for you. If you're here and you're not saved, you are to come to know Christ. Tell me quickly, raise your hand and say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. Would you raise your hand way up high just for a second? Isn't it good to know the Lord, folks? Now, if you don't know for sure you're saved, you ought to come and get saved tonight. If you need to come and pray for yourself or pray for someone else tonight, the invitation is not going to be long tonight. You, you can get out. You know what you need to do. You don't need to play around with you. You don't need to deal with. If you need to deal with some pride in your heart, you get up. You come and say, God, I want you to help me. I want you to help me. They're playing for us on the instruments. Need to come. If you'd come pray for your pastor, just ask God to keep him in the fight. You come do that if you want to. While we're waiting just a few seconds, I want you to come. If you're going to get baptized tonight, I want you to come. This is the church family you are to be a part of. I want you to come tonight. I want you to come tonight. You do that. You need to come. need to rededicate your life tonight. need to pray about something. I want you to come. You young people need to come. I want you to come. While we're waiting just a second. You want to ask God to just keep you in the fight? Keep you where you need to be? You come while we're waiting just a second. Folks will be praying. We'll baptize in just a moment. are coming just for a few minutes. You can come on if you need to, if you want to. God, I pray God will keep us in the fight. God, help us. Help me. play for us. I'll get ready to baptize while they're playing for us.
Bill Langford, I want Bill's family to stand. Family and friends is here tonight. Stand up just for a second, if you would. These folks have been a blessing to our church, I'll Amen. tell you. Amen. But uh, Bill has just been struggling a long time with his salvation. I talked with him. I think Brother Harvey talked with him. Brother Price had talked with him. And the other day he just came under great conviction, said, I gotta get it settled. And he got saved, and I'm glad he did. Amen. Love you, Bill. Love your family. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I'm buried with Christ in baptism. This is a wall for you to survive. Good job. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. 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 Turn in your psalm books, please, to 246. Redeemed how I left to proclaim it. <clears throat> Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed to His infinite mercy, His child in forever I am, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Redeem, redeem. 
Brother Bill did was a great milestone in his life. First of all, if everybody thinks you're saved and you know you're not, it's kind of hard to face it, isn't it? But I'm glad he did, aren't you? I'm glad he did so. And we're gonna, his, him and his family is going to come sit here. We're going to shake hands with you and rejoice with you tonight. He'll be out in just a moment if you want to come on up. Uh, any of you that wish to, if his family is welcome, welcome to come and sit here with him. We'll get a chance to tell you we love you and appreciate you if you want to come and do that. Uh, we had one saved on visitation last week. Let me share some good news with you while he's coming. Isn't that wonderful? And good to know that people are, get saved. A lady, a lady of the Lord that cannot read or write. She cannot read or write. Or can barely write. But uh, I'm glad she got saved. Glad she got saved. And then uh, they had one saved at the prison ministry. We have a prison ministry on uh, the second Sunday night. And it's the third Saturday night. We go to the prison. Some men of our church go to the prison. And they had one saved there last night. Had a good service. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. And then we have a jail ministry at Anderson County Jail every Thursday night. And Benita said there was, how many of you got saved? Isn't that wonderful, folks? Listen to me now. Did you know that there's, uh, there's all kinds of churches that go the whole year and never baptize anybody? There's churches that go time after time and never have anybody saved. And listen to me, we get so used to it, but something we don't need to get used to. When people get saved and baptized, that's the work of God in their hearts. And we ought to be thankful for that. Is that right? We sure. Bill, I'm glad you did that. Proud of you. I love you. Stand to your feet. When you tell three people you love them and come by and shake hands with Bill, you can go home. You can go home. Come by and shake hands with him now. Take time and do that. Take time and do that.